All right. Hello, hello. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome to our webinar for today. Uh, my name is Heather Grant. I am one of the community admins here at the Maintenance Community by Upkeep. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us for our webinar today. If you are not already a member of the maintenance community on Slack, we would love to have you join us. I will drop the sign up link in the chat in just a moment. Today we have James from Eridicio joining for a presentation on Fracas, learning from plant failures. I will let him introduce himself in just a moment, but I know our presentation will be a great one. The recording from our session today will be available at this link right after we end our presentation, as well as in the maintenance community on Slack tomorrow, along with a copy of the slides that you see here today. James is also available to answer questions live in the Slack group, so please feel free to share the recording of this webinar, as well as the invitation to Slack with friends or colleagues, anyone else you know uh, who would benefit from hearing some of James's expertise. Uh, last piece of housekeeping, then we'll go ahead and get started with our main event. Uh, you'll notice that your camera cameras and microphones are not turned on today, so what you'll want to do if you have any questions to ask James as we go through the presentation is you'll use the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen there. Feel free to chat your questions throughout the presentation as they come up, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end of our time today. Anything we don't get to, we will answer offline in the community as well, so please feel free to ask away. That is all from me. Um, thank you again for making the time to be here. Thank you, James, especially, and I will turn it over to you to get started. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Heather. Welcome, everyone. Today we're going to talk about fracas. All right, we're going to learn from plant failures. We're going to learn how to improve our equipment based on what's actually happening in real time in our facilities. All right, so before we dive into that, though, I'm just going to do a brief introduction to myself. So my name is James Kvasvik. I'm a principal instructor at Iridicio. Uh, I am based in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. For those that aren't sure where that is, it's right across the border from Detroit, Michigan. Um, been involved in maintenance and reliability for about 17 years in various forms and functions. Maintenance electrician, planner, supervisor, maintenance manager, corporate reliability lead, and then now as an instructor consultant with Aerodicio. Um, my travels throughout this have brought me all over the globe. So I've spent time in the Middle East, I've spent some time in Africa, South America, Europe, and obviously North America, implementing maintenance and reliability programs, delivering training, that sort of thing. Um, recently co-authored a book, Design for Maintainability. You can see that up there. Also have a weekly podcast by the name of Rooted in Reliability. And then three great kids and a wife, two crazy dogs to keep us busy, if there wasn't enough already going on. All right, so that's enough about me. Let's get into fracas, all right? So fracas, you know, big topic. Lots of people have questions around it. How does it work? Um, how do we really get the results from it that we want? That type of thing. So we're gonna talk about that. Now, as we're going through, if you have questions, go ahead, throw them in the chat box or the question box, and we'll work through um, answering those. And uh, as we go, and we'll save some time at the end as well to kind of talk through some other things as well. All right, so let's get to it. So what is FRACUS? All right, well, it stands for Failure Reporting Analysis Corrective, Corrective Action System, right? And really, it's there to collect, analyze failures, breakdowns, uh, stoppages, even if they're minor stoppages in the production system, um, or even potential failures. So if we're doing corrective maintenance, capturing those potential failures, not a full functional failure. And we want to capture that data and then work to prevent those issues from reoccurring, all right? It verifies how effective our solutions are from a corrective or preventative actions. Um, reason, it, reason it does that is we're gonna continue to monitor those failures and failures after the actions to verify that they are in fact um, solving the problem. Fracas originally designed for the US Navy. Um, there's a mill standard on it, uh, sta mill standard 2155. Most people don't use that, it's a little bit older, um, but we're gonna talk through the various ways of managing fracas. So what we first start off with fracas, there's lots of pieces that go into it. We're gonna walk through the fracas process itself, some of the supporting elements that you need to be successful with it. But the big thing for fracas is it's really a closed loop system for solving reliability problems. All right, we're gonna try and remove those failure mechanisms one way or another, whether it's through preventative maintenance action, predictive maintenance actions, corrective maintenance actions, or redesigns and so on and so forth. We're gonna validate that those are effective. 
So at a very high level, what we're going to want to do is we're going to make sure we have a failure mode analysis done. Now, this might be a FMEA, FMECA, or our CM analysis, but we want to understand the failure modes we're going to see within our assets. From there, we're going to be able to build failure codes. So if you're running SAP or Maximo or a lot of the other CMMSs out there, you can capture failure codes. And they're usually a part problem cause, object damage cause, something of that nature. And that's where our failure modes really come in. From there, as these things fail, as we're performing corrective actions, we're going to capture all of this information through our work order system. All right? And as we're capturing it, we're going to start reviewing it. And that's where the work order history analysis comes in. But if we don't have a good work management system, a good mechanism for tracking work, validating failure modes that we saw during the repairs, those sorts of things, we're going to struggle a little bit. From there, we're going to do a root cause analysis really understand what is going on, what's driving that failure mode. And then from there, we're going to make our strategy adjustments, right? And that would be preventative, predictive, redesign, those types of things. And then we're going to monitor our failure codes again to see if those failure modes that we identified are going away. Right? So a lot going on there, but let's talk about why we want to do this. All right, so the big thing, there we go. Big thing is why do we want to use Fracas? Well, we're really looking at improving reliability and availability. All right, we want to make sure that the equipment's available to run when we want to. We want to improve the reliability, so ensuring that's going to operate over a period of time, failure-free for us. We want to decrease those life cycle costs as we remove some of these corrective actions or corrective maintenance activities and these breakdowns. We're going to reduce how much it costs to operate and maintain. By using a fracas system, we're able to identify environmental and safety risks and really work to eliminate those. If we see failure modes related to those continually to reoccur, we know we're not being effective when we can go after those and drive those down. We're also looking to decrease that downtime. Now, that downtime is not just unplanned downtime, it could be planned downtime. If we're in a sold out situation and we have a lot of planned downtime for certain PM activities, certain corrective activities, we can use Fracas to help drive those through as well. All right, so lots of opportunities here for Fracas. Now, to make Fracas work, all right, you need to have certain things in place. We're going to cover what I call the supporting elements first. The first thing we need is an asset hierarchy. All right, we need a good, well-defined asset hierarchy so we know where these failure modes are occurring. If we have a very large system as one asset, and within that large system we have multiple pumps, multiple motors, various other uh, subsystems, but all rolling up to one asset, that fracas is going to be a lot more work because now we're trying to discern, is it this pump, is it this motor, is it this pump, that motor, and so on and so forth. So we want to have our good asset hierarchy, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a second. The other thing we need is we need a good work management system. If we don't have a good way to track breakdowns, preventative actions, corrective actions, those sorts of things, fracas is going to be very difficult. All right, so we need to make sure we have a good work management system. It's easy to capture the failure modes. It's easy to capture downtime, number of events, all those different things. And if we don't have that, we're really going to struggle. From there, we need a good root cause analysis process. If we have all this data that says these are the failure modes we're experiencing, but we don't have a way to solve those problems, we're going to struggle again. Lastly, we need a failure code development process. And this is really how do we build our failure code library load that into the CMMS so we can actually capture good data easily. We need that for a few reasons. We want to reduce the amount of time to data mine. We want to make it easy for our technicians and mechanics and electricians to capture that information. And without a good failure code development process, we're left to essentially free tax entry and that becomes a nightmare to try and work through. All right. So we also need to have a good formalized and documented procedure for fracas. All right, so fracas itself needs a procedure or a process, and I'm going to walk through that with you in a bit. And there's a lot more elements that flow into that. We'll take a look at that in a few moments. But let's start with the hierarchy. All right, we need a good asset hierarchy. Reason this, reason this is so important is it allows us to really zone in on the problem asset that we're dealing with, the bad actor, or if we're dealing with a larger systemic problem, is it reciprocating pumps across the facility. It'll allow us to do that and analyze failures in those ways. Is it asset class and type? Is it a specific individual asset? Is it across a certain system or unit that we're seeing these repeat failure modes? 
So having a good asset hierarchy allows us to really deep dive that. All right. Now, this example here, ISO 14224, many of you are probably familiar with it, comes from oil and gas. You don't have to follow ISO 14224 to have a good asset hierarchy. The big thing, it's gotta be consistent, it's gotta allow you to capture the right information, and also make sure you have the right parent-child relationships. If you have all that done and you're not using ISO 14224, that's fine. We just want a structured approach to build our asset hierarchy. The other big decision point for everyone as you're looking at asset hierarchy and how it's linking the fracas is you see here we have at level six equipment and unit. We also have subunits at seven and maintainable items at eight. Not every organization is going to go six, seven, eight. Some may just go to seven. Some may just stop at six. That's a business decision for you guys and the disadvantages to not going all the way to eight and nine. It's going to be a little bit more data quality mining that type of thing. A little bit more work to get to the actual um, failure codes and what specific component was having those failure codes, that type of thing. But on the plus side, it's a little bit easier for your mechanics to collect that data. Now, if we dive deeper and we're capturing data at the level eight um, component maintainable item there, a little bit more work for the mechanics technicians, a little bit more change management activities there, a little more training for them, but it makes our lives easier when we're trying to analyze the failure modes in the fracas process. Right. So we're not going to spend too much more time on asset hierarchy. If you want more information on asset hierarchy, I'm more than happy to chat offline about it. Some of the other stuff we need is the asset data behind that hierarchy. So operational data, environmental data, we might be using cost data as well or maintenance and failure data. So operational data, environmental data, that's part of the asset hierarchy piece. The failure data, maintenance data, cost data, that's coming from the work management system. All right, so all this data is going to combine these assets. Now, with the fracas, we're really focusing on the failure data, right? Failure reporting, analysis, corrective, corrective action system. We want to be able to capture all that. So we need good hi hierarchy and a good work management process to capture all this different data to allow us to solve the problems. I mentioned we need a good work management system. Now, work management system, we need to be able to capture those failure modes. Not just failure modes, but how much downtime, how much cost, all those different aspects. So when we go to do our fracas process, we can prioritize what we want to tackle. Now, this is an example of a fairly simple work management process. And you can see here, it doesn't matter if we walk through the planning, planning process. So we go from work identification, planning, scheduling, work execution. It comes back to closeout and history. If we walk through the emergency process and we go to unscheduled work, it still goes to closeout in history. This is vital. If we're not capturing that failure modes, we're not capturing that information, we're not going to be able to do fracas. Fracas is really some of these lumped into these reliability processes here. Without that data, we're pretty much stuck making educated guesses at best. All right, good question, Neil. So. ISO 14224 is a great reference. Um, however, it was designed for oil and gas, and sometimes it's more than what others need. And at the same instance, it covers equipment related to oil and gas, not a lot of other industries. So some organizations will use ISO 14224 as a baseline or as a starting point and expand on it. Others will use it as a framework and develop their own equipment hierarchy. Um, there's a couple things I can point to you afterwards around how to build that good asset hierarchy. All right. So now that we got a good work management process in place, we can actually start to continue to move forward. All right. Now we get to our fracas process. Now this fracas process, a lot of different pieces in here. All right. But where, where it's going to start is we're going to identify a bad actor. Now, what is a bad actor? That's really an asset that's not doing what we want it to do. And it's either having excess amounts of downtime, it's costing us more than we expect to maintain. It might be the number of downtime events, it might be a quality issue or so on and so forth. But that bad actor is really identifying what assets do we need to focus on. From there, we're gonna to move to the second step and that is really to verify that that asset is important to the organization. So we want to verify against our asset criticality. And if it's low criticality, 
we're going to not work on that. We're going to work on something else that's more important to the organization. If it's important, then we're going to move on to our failure mode analysis process. Now, if we already have failure modes and failure codes defined, then this process we're going to breeze right through because we don't need to define failure codes to capture and trend over time. Once we've defined our failure codes, we're going to have that entered into the system. Our mechanics are going to do their work. They're going to record their history, and we're going to review it at a periodic intervals to identify any specific trends. Do we see a lot of issues with a certain component, a certain damage, or a certain cause? And then we're going to work through those issues. From there, we'll Pareto those failure codes, figure out which ones are most important to that asset, perform an RCA on the top five most important failure modes that we're seeing. We're going to approve some solutions, whether it's corrective, preventative, redesign, rebuild, so on and so forth. Implement those solutions. We're going to pass it off to the work management process to get those things executed. But then we're also going to trend those failure codes again to make sure that our solution was effective in eliminating them. It's really a closed loop system that we're trying to develop here. So let's dive into these a little bit further. First one, bad actor. All right, we got to identify the bad actor. Now, many CMMSs have some sort of bad actor report. You know, you can run it based on number of downtime occurrences, total downtime minutes, maintenance costs, quality of defects, maintenance hours. You can identify bad actors in a wide range of different ways. The key here is make sure you identify or use criteria that is specific to your organization. Right, so if your organization is very concerned about quality, a little bit less about cost, then make sure you focus on those quality incidents. If you're more focused on cost, then focus on that. Right, so make sure you're using the right metrics for your organization. So once we've identified these bad actors based on these incidents, now we know what we're going to focus on. All right, so most organizations I know will set up a reoccurring report and they'll run a bad actor analysis you know, the first Monday of every month based on the past month's performance, and then they'll reuse the fracas process every single month. They'll rewalk through it for those targeted assets. From there, we gotta have to verify asset criticality. So here, however you set up asset criticality, whether it's an example like the one below here, the one up here, we're gonna verify that it does fall within our important assets. Now, what I say important assets for most organizations is usually that top 20 to 40% of assets in terms of criticality. Those are the ones we're going to want to focus on for a bad actor in the fracas process. Things below that 40%, if they're critical to safety, life, quality, compliance, those types of things, we may include those as well as exceptions. But as a general rule of thumb, top 20 to 40% are the ones we're truly focused on because those are the most critical to the organization. So now we've identified our bad actor, we verified that it's worth going after through criticality. Now we got to make sure that we have failure codes. Now not every organization has good failure codes within their CMMS, so we're going to talk about how do we develop those. So the big thing for me for failure codes is first understanding failure modes. All right. So if you take a failure mode and break it down to its simplest components, there's three things that a failure mode will tell us. It'll tell us a part. It'll tell us the problem with that part, and it'll tell us the cause of that part. It's not good enough to say bearing failed, right? Because we all know there's many different ways a bearing can fail. So in this instance, we want to know what part it was. In this instance, a bearing. How, how did it fail? What was the problem? So was it seized? Was it worn? Or was it damaged? Very different causes for each one of those, and we need to be able to differentiate those for us to do a good RCA on it. Now from there, if it's seized, we ask ourselves, why is it seized? Is it due to lack of lubrication, due to misalignment, due to overhung load, and so on and so forth? These are going to drive different corrective or preventative actions. Lack of lubrication, we can put in a PM for that. That's going to solve that problem. Due to misalignment, that's an installation problem. So installation, was it training? Did we not have the right tools? And so on and so forth. Overhung load, that's a design issue. PMs aren't going to help us with that. So by identifying these three components, the part, the problem, the cause, we can really hone in on what do we have to solve for that bad actor. Now, if it's worn, we have a couple of different examples here. If it's damaged, why was it damaged? Those are the three key components we need for failure codes. Now, if you look at ISO 14224 again, they have some examples of what you would see for specific causes, 
um, design issues, installation issues, procedural issues, and so on and so forth. They have a good generic approach. I want to dive a little deeper than that. Now, a lot of organizations will use the, the failure mode effect analysis or FMEA process to build out their failure codes. What that will look like is something like this. So as an example, for a motor, a motor is the maintainable item we're looking at in the hierarchy. We're doing work on that motor. The mechanics or electricians are going to have to enter those other failure codes. They're going to have to enter the part, problem, cause. So here we can see a part. It's a contact. Now when we click on that contact, then it would give us appropriate damages related to that contact. From there, we would pick on the, pick the appropriate damage, then we would have what is the cause. Right? And by doing that, we make it easy for our mechanics or electricians or whoever's inputting that data to select the right failure codes. Right? For a motor, we may also have a starter. We may also have bearings and so on and so forth. And each one of those will drive the preceding boxes. So if I click on motor, I would pick my part, then it would give me the appropriate options for that part, and then the appropriate causes for that damage. They're all linked in like a master library approach. What we don't want to see here a lot of is broke, fixed, other, unknown. What we see in a lot of organizations, if we provide those, we don't get good data. Now, if it's unknown or other, we want a written description on what that is so we can mine that data and really understand what, what, what it was. Another example for a bearing, or sorry, for a pump, we might have a bearing, a shaft, impeller, and so on and so forth. And you can see for each one of these, we would have the appropriate damage and related causes to those. Right. Like I said, this requires effort, requires a lot of work to develop, but it makes the whole fracas process easier because we're getting good, consistent, standardized data. Right. Now, once we have those failure codes in place, now we've got to capture that information. And this is where really enlisting our tradespeople into the process becomes vital. Right? So Paul Berenger, um, I'm sure many of you would recognize that name. He had, a, he had a process for explaining how do you capture the right information to do reliability analysis. And he always referred to the death certificate information. All right? We need to know the birth date or the install date of that part, the death date, whether it was failed or the removal date. So if it was good, but we removed as part of a time-based replacement, we want to have that information. And then the cause of death or what was the failure codes. Armed with these three key pieces of information, we can run fracas, we can run Weibull analysis, we can do a lot of different things. Right? But the key here is, is we got to make sure we're getting good information from our mechanics. So it needs to be built into the work order process to ensure we're getting that right data consistently. Now those failure codes, sometimes, you know, they may be removed due to PM activity. So they're still good when we remove them, but based on our current program, we remove that. We need that for sensor data or suspended data. That gives us a lot of insights to the expected life of these assets. All right, so we wanna be able to capture the, this information. Now the way I've always organized it with, within CMMSs is this master library approach. We have a common list of components, we have a common list of damages, and then a common list of causes, but we map using the CMMS uh, programming, if you will, which ones match each. So for example, um, I'm very familiar with SAP, so I'll use that as a quick example. You have asset class and asset type within SAP. So asset class would be a motor. Type might be AC motor or stepper motor or so on and so forth. That two, those two combinations there would then tell us which parts are specific or applicable to that asset. So in this example, you can see we got a motor, a belt, and a shaft. Those are in that, or a bearing and a shaft. Those are part of the motor. We also have a conveyor here that would have a bushing, pulley, shaft, belt, bearing. But we're not going to list all those other things that don't apply to the motor in that list because then it just really makes it more difficult for that data collection to occur for the mechanics. The other thing is if you give them a big list they got to sort through, they're not going to select the right one every time. I had one mechanic tell me, I always pick the seventh one down the list because it's easy and no one suspects that I'm just randomly picking them. So we need to have a good, easy list to use and this master library approach helps. From there, once we have the parts mapped to the individual components or maintainable items, then we would map the damages. So bearings could be fluted, corroded cracked, pitted, and so on and so forth. Shaft might just be 
corroded, deformed, cracked, or pitted. So we have those things that are similar, but they're mapped to each specific one. And this is all about making it easy to collect good data. Now, at this point, we have actually picked our bad, ass, bad actor, we've verified criticality, we've defined our failure codes, set them up within the CMS, we've captured our failure codes. Now, we gotta review the work order history, right? And using these newly defined failure codes, we're gonna review our work order history and categorize failures, right? The better the failure codes and ease of data capture, the easier and less data mining that you'll actually have to do because it's standardized data. It'd be very easy to run some quick analysis on that. But what, regardless of how we're doing it, we wanna review the failure codes, review the work order history for each bad actor, make sure that we're not seeing any anomalies in that data and we're having, you know, easily identifiable issues, that sort of thing. If we don't have good failure codes, we gotta go through each work order and call out what those failure modes are, right? So the part problem caused for each work order. So sometimes it'll be pretty easy just going through the uh, comments in the work order to pull that stuff out. Other times it can be a lot more difficult. This is why we wanna rely on those failure codes. From there, we're gonna categorize those failures into common issues, you know, bearing issues, lubrication issues, installation, corrosion, that sort of thing. We're gonna categorize them into those different aspects. So that way, when we tackle this issue, it's not just this one single event, but if we're having a lot of issues with lubrication across this asset or system, we're gonna target that and it's gonna pack that entire asset or system. From there, we're gonna Pareto the failure codes, right? And we're really gonna focus on the ones that are most important. Now, in our process, we talk about five top failure codes. Now, depending on your organization, you may wanna tackle only the top two or three, or you may set a threshold where it doesn't matter how many there are, if they're above a certain total amount of time, certain number of incidents, certain costs, we're gonna tackle them all. Okay. So in this example here, you can see we got all of our failure codes down here mapped out. We're gonna target a few of these. So what we have here is RCA priority one, RCA priority two. So what does that mean? Well, RCA priority one, or these are the things that must be addressed within the next month. We gotta do the RCA, to define our actions. We might not get our actions implemented, but we want to make sure we're addressing these right away. RCA priority twos, those are things we want to address, but are not as important. All right, so you see down here, we got a couple here starting generally around metal fatigue and carrying on to over here around vibration and so on and so forth. Those ones, if we have time, we'll address, but main ones we want to do is get these ones up here in the red. Right. So we're going to prioritize or Pareto our failure codes for that particular asset that we're focused on. Right. We're going to work through this, build that all out. Now, here's the hard part. Once we actually get those failure codes Pareto, we've got to do a lot of work. Up until now, we've done some data mining, some data organization, some basic data analysis. But now we really got to get into solving the problem. Right. So we gotta perform an RCA for the top five failure modes that we're seeing. And there's a couple different ways we can do that. Might use something called a fault tree or a logic tree. Now, those of you not familiar with this, NASA has a free guide that you can download. It is fantastic, it goes through this in detail. But really what it is, it's a branching five Y. All right, and we use logic gates to tell us are things related or not related. This is a very good tool for very targeted machine specific failures, right? Very targeted, easy to, not easy to solve, but targeted small scope of work. We also have some other tools that we may have to leverage. We may have something like these ones here that are time, what we would call time tools. A sequence of events here. Up here you would also have your sequence of event and causal factor events analysis, right? What we do is we kind of map out our timeline identify which one or multiple of these events would we use, could we eliminate to reduce the potential of that event occurring. So in a single timeline, we're just gonna target one or two of these. It stops or reduces the risk of that event occurring to an acceptable level. In an event and causal factor analysis with multiple timelines, we may have to target things from both timelines or maybe it's just all one timeline we're focusing on. And if we identify what are those forcing functions, so in this example here, you can see we have an operator that's accelerating, 
that's texting while driving. This one accelerated out of the driveway. We have three forcing functions here that we can work on eliminating to prevent this incident from occurring here. Right? So we can use this to help identify where do we really need to focus. Now, if we don't have a lot of good information, if you know it's an asset we're not that familiar with, or we don't have evidence to kind of work through systematically solving those problems, then we can move to something like a uh, FMEA, we can move to something like a fishbone and so on and so forth to really start to brainstorm what are the potential causes here and work through solving those. All right. Now keep in mind, if you've followed this process, you likely have an FMEA already from the failure code development. So that may help you speed up your process of solving that problem. Maybe there's only two or three failure modes you got to add or causes to those failure modes that we have to review as opposed to developing one from scratch. All right, quick question. James, what do I say about the Pareto 80-20 law? Perfect, so let's go back to this and we'll talk about that. In some instances, it may only be, to your point, we're only targeting a couple of these right here because it's the biggest source of losses. Just happens so in this instance, we have a lot of issues with this asset, so we gotta solve more of them. But sometimes, you'll generally see about 80% of our problems are only driven by about 20% of those failure modes. All right, so that's what we're trying to do here. But in our experience, most assets, they typically have quite a few different things going on. So that's why we say target five are the top five failure modes as a starting point. That's a balance. If you have an asset where a lot of different things are going on, you may have to do a little bit more. If you have an asset where it's really only one or two failure modes or failure codes that are driving your issues, then you'd only target the one or two. We use that five as a rule of thumb, if you will. So we're going to use these RCA tools to get down and solve the problem. Now, a couple key things here with RCA before we go too far. We've got to make sure we solve to the right level. So if we're solving the problem using root cause analysis, we can't just focus on replace the part, provide training, so on and so forth. Um, that's not going to get us all the way there. We've got to get down to the systemic levels. And what I mean by that is, what is the management system level of things that are caused, that's enabling these failures to occur? So for example, if we have an issue with bearing installation, right? we don't have bearing installation being done correctly, why is that? Well, so-and-so mechanic didn't do it correctly. Well, we can go coach that mechanic, but that's not gonna prevent other mechanics from doing the same thing. So what's the management system level issues that are enabling that mechanic to install the bearing correctly? Do we not have a, a standard? Do we not have the right tools? Do we not provide the right training? And so on and so forth. And if we can address those types of things, that not only impacts that one asset and that one mechanic, but it impacts everyone in that area or that organization. So when we're solving these problems, we gotta get to at least the management level system. If our solutions are to go train, so on and so forth, um, an individual, that's not really gonna help. We gotta train everyone. We gotta have that standard and tools and so on and so forth. Can I explain fault tree analysis and an or? Yes, I can. So we will walk, I'll walk through an example with you right now before we move on. So in this fault tree here, we have the and and or gates, all right? And for those that haven't worked a lot with fault trees, it works just like a five why. We're gonna ask ourselves why and build down these branches. The only difference is, is it's branching which means it's not just one why that enabled that event to occur, but there could be multiple ones that are supporting or could also influence that. So in this example here, I'll use the example of a fire, all right? So if we have a pure fire, that's the event that took place. Now, what are the three things we need for a fire? Fuel, oxygen, ignition. So in each one of these boxes, it'd be fuel, oxygen, ignition. And we know from the fire triangle that we need all three in place to have that fire occur. Therefore, we would put an AND gate there. We need all three to be successful for that event to occur. The OR gates are saying either one of these could have triggered that follow-on event. So in this example here, down here, this box or this box would enable this to occur. Right now, in order for this next up event to occur, both of these had to be present. So what it does is it allows you to rule out 
Is it an individual event that I got to solve? Do I have a bunch of smaller events? Or in this instance up here, I can remove any one of these top three levels and it will be, and that issue will not occur. I can either remove the oxygen, the fuel, or the ignition source. And because it's an AND gate, removing any one of those will prevent that incident from occurring or tells me I have to solve all of them. If that doesn't help clarify, I'll be more than happy to talk through at the end of the session or offline about the fault tree, the AND and OR gates, and so on and so forth. All right. Now, once we've gone through and we've done all of our root cause analysis, and this is really where I see a lot of organizations fail, and it's approving and implementing the solutions. All right, They come up with a ton of solutions. They don't know which ones to implement. Um, they don't get them implemented, that sort of thing. A lot of organizations get good to this point, and then they kind of struggle. So the way I kind of want to talk through this is we got to approve the solutions. And this is really about identifying what can we do about those issues we identified, but then how do we make sure we have support from our stakeholders, right? Because if we come up with all these solutions and our stakeholders don't support it, we're not going to be effective. It's not going to get implemented. So there's two ways we typically see organizations identify or approve the right solutions. First one, over here on the right, it's a pretty simple box. We're looking at tactical plans here, low effort, low reward. We're using them to build buy into the process. Generally, if it's a first couple times we're doing fracas, from there, we're going to want to move up to the quick wins. All right, these are going to be higher returns, still low effort, but they're going to give us some positive financial gains. Now, sometimes those are not enough for us to solve some of these problems. For example, you know, we can develop a quick bearing installation standard or alignment standard for when we're installing uh, rotating equipment. You know, it's some effort, but it's going to standardize how we do this. Now, the larger initiative might be we need a whole precision maintenance program. So it's not just an individual thing on rotating equipment for alignment, but how do we install bearings? How do we check soft foot and so on and so forth? It's a lot more work, but that's going to have a huge impact across the entire organization. So you kind of prioritize one, two, three. And then the stuff down here in these time wasters, you're not going to want to do those. Those too much effort for the return, we're going to ignore those types of ones. So what you can do is you can put some uh, scales on this. So for impact, you can put um, the ROI, how much downtime you're going to save, so on and so forth. For effort, you can put you know, how much maintenance hours or estimated cost and so on and so forth. And then you just kind of plot them on this four square grid to select what you're going to do. The other one is what we call a decision funnel, right? And this one's really a lot more robust way to solve or to select the right solutions. So first thing we do is we state the decision to be made. And that is to eliminate this issue from reoccurring or to reduce the probability of it from reoccurring from X to Y, that sort of thing. We're gonna agree what those objectives are. You know. Most RCAs will never eliminate that event from ever occurring again, but it will reduce the risk of it reoccurring. So we're going to agree what the objectives are and how are we going to measure it. So for some instances, it might be we're going to increase MTBF by 500 hours or 1,000 hours, improve availability from X to Y, and so on and so forth. From there, we're going to brainstorm our activities that we can do to solve that problem based on the RCA we did. Once we have those, we're going to evaluate them. And what we mean by evaluate is cost, return, do they add additional risk to the organization, and so on and so forth. From there, we're going to work out the risks, all right? If they provide, if they create additional risks, we may not want to do them because those new risks might outweigh the risks we're dealing with already. So we want to work all those out. Then we're going to confirm our decision and then agree to the implementation of those solutions, all right? So two different ways to go through and go about approving the solutions. If you want some more information on really the decision funnel, let me know. I'll be more than happy to work through that with you and get that to you. From there, we got to agree to the implementation, right? So lots goes on in that implementation piece. And like I said, this is where you see a lot of organizations struggle. They do an RCA, they implement three out of the five actions and it continues to fail. And they go back and look, they realize they don't have those other ones. So what we need to do is we got to do some solution planning. Whether it's a Gantt chart, project plan, action tracker, we need something like that to make sure that we know who's doing it, when is it due, how long is it going to take, and so on and so forth. And that's really a planning process. The implementation, 
is tracking against that. You might have an action log or so on and so forth where you're verifying stuff's being implemented, it's done on time and so on and so forth. We're gonna run a report on this. Where we, how far are we in our implementation? Are we seeing initial signs of success, so on and so forth? We're gonna have a verification piece and we'll talk about that a bit more. And that's really, are we seeing a reduction in failure codes, downtime, so on and so forth for that targeted bad actor asset that we're working on, right? It might be we're seeing downtime come down, but we're seeing a significant reduction in the failure modes that we targeted. From there, we wanna make sure there's metrics in place to, that, to ensure that it will sustain itself long-term, right? From there, we wanna leverage across the organization. If we solve this problem on this pump, how do we carry that across the other pumps? If we solve this problem at this site, how do we share it with the other sites within the organization so they don't have to relearn the hard way, right? So if we do all this well, we should be solving our reliability problems. From there, the last thing we're gonna do is we're really just gonna trend the failure codes, all right? We're gonna make sure that those bad actors we've already worked on have the reduction in downtime, have the reduction in number of downtime occurrences, so on and so forth. We're also gonna make sure that the failure codes that we focused on are, are trending down themselves as well. All right, we may solve some of these failure codes. We'll see those being impacted quite a bit where they're not reoccurring, but downtime is still very high on that asset. So if that's the case, then it tells us we gotta go after other failure codes or these failure codes were masking symptoms of an, another thing that we have to solve. So we wanna continue to monitor the failure rates and failure codes for those assets that we've already targeted. We want to see that downtime cost whatever come down over time. The other big advantage to this is if we've done a good FMEA or RCM analysis, we should be able to look at these failure codes that are trending over time and link back to that FMEA or RCM. It, pro it provides a closed loop. So if we're seeing a lot of failure modes related to bearings, damage due to lack of lubrication, we can loop that back to the FMEA and RCM and say, did we target these? Did we identify them as a high risk risk item? Did we identify the right maintenance solution and so on and so forth? And if not, we can just update that FMEA, RCM, update our job plans and so on and so forth. All right, so it's a good way to verify the effectiveness of your maintenance strategy. So Fracas, super powerful tool, but it requires a lot of working pieces to make it work. You gotta have a good hierarchy, good work management system, good RCA system. You have to have failure codes. All right, now developing those failure codes like we talked about could be, come from, could be coming from an FMEA or RCM event you do. Some CMMSs have stuff preloaded to some extent. Other, other organizations will buy failure code libraries that break it up into all that level of detail um, with additional pieces as well. So there's lots of different ways you can tackle those. Um, the key here is you gotta have a process and you also have to have someone to run it. Now I sometimes see maintenance planners or maintenance supervisors trying to manage this while, while they're doing their day job. Uh, sometimes I see it successful, sometimes you know it's not as successful as it could be, but you gotta make sure you identify who is doing these activities, giving them time to work through them. Those RCAs can't be rushed, the data analysis can't be rushed. Take the time, do it correctly, and you'll be successful. All right, so. With that, that concludes the presentation, but I'll be happy to answer some questions. And I see we've got a few here. So how many actors can be expected to be involved in the process? So in terms of actors, do you mean bad actors as in equipment and assets, or do you mean number of people involved in the entire process? If you can clarify that, I'd be happy to answer. All right, other questions. Uh, have you encountered a case after implementing the solution, newer different failure codes appear? Yes, we see that often. Sometimes, you know, we're seeing failures related to equipment damage. So we're thinking, you know, based on the information available, it might have been a improper installation, improper design, that sort of thing. We work through those, we kind of solve those, but the, those failure modes still continue to appear or other ones appear. And it might be related to how it was being operated, that type of thing that we see come up on a regular basis. So it's not uncommon to still have some of those assets high up on your bad actor list, even though you've solved the top three, five, 10 failure modes for it. 
All right, what indicators do you recommend using in RM9? All right, let me go back to RM9 so we can share for everyone. All right, so for indicators up here in metrics, we're generally going to want to look at something like MTBF, availability, so on and so forth, whatever those whatever the things are that, that your organization is focused on, number of quality incidents, stuff of that nature. And we want to make sure that it's, it's appropriate and aligned with the organizational uh, structure and goals. Is there a logical criteria for using one of the techniques for analysis, five fly, fishbone, fall tree? Yes, there is. So I'll scooch back one sec. All right, so the way I typically perform this, if it's a asset related problem, a specific component, maintainable item, we got a pretty good problem statement. I'm gonna use one of these tree tools, whether it's a fall tree or logic tree, I'm gonna kind of target with that. If it's a problem where I don't have a lot of good information, it's a very large complex problem, there's not a good um, evidence for that problem and we're kind of just using S educated guesses, that type of thing, I'm gonna use an FMEA. Now, if it's a if it's a problem that has um, time data, whether it's information coming from the SCADA system, uh, video fault logs, whatever it may be, and we're not really sure what we really need to solve, then what I'll do is I'll use one of these time tools, whether it's the sequence of events or event and causal factor analysis, to identify the forcing functions. Once I identify those forcing functions. Then I will take this, so for example, accelerated out of driveway. We know that's the forcing function we want to tackle. And I would take that, put it right here on top of the fault tree, and that becomes the top box of my fault tree. So the time tools are really good at helping us separate what do we really need to solve to prevent this from reoccurring. And then once we have that, then we can deep dive using one of the other tools. Hopefully that answered your question. All right, going back to the chat. Number of people, okay. Good, good question. So normally you're gonna have one individual who is responsible for executing this process, a reliability engineer, a maintenance engineer, someone of that nature. They're gonna do the analysis. They're gonna kind of walk through this process. Now, if we don't have good failure codes, then the FMEA, they may facilitate, but they're gonna need a couple people to participate in that FMEA, operators, mechanics, maybe a planner, supervisor, stuff of that nature. Same thing with the RCA. Um, that one individual is going to be facilitating, but they will need a few people to support that RCA. If that one responsible person is doing RCA by themselves at their desk, I have a lot of concerns about the effectiveness of it. So you want to make sure you have quite a few people there working on that together. Um, is there a preferred software that helps execute the fracas process? So there's a couple different options. Most organizations will rely on their CMMS. All right. That way we get our work order history. We can look at our failure codes. From there, you can export out to you know, Excel, do your analysis there. There are a couple off the shelf fracas systems out there, if you will, software packages. Um, I think Reliasoft makes one, um, Nexus makes one, and there's a few others. Um, but normally that is a little bit more advanced. I would say don't rush out to software work through your process, build your process first, understand what you really need the software to do first, then potentially look at it. Um, I see one area I see software become very helpful is if you're doing this across an organizational standpoint and you're trying to share all these learnings across multiple sites, continents, that type of thing, it makes it very easy to search, reuse, that type of thing. All right, and what base can we choose which RCA is suitable for the problem. So I think I may have answered that, but just in case I didn't, um, fault trees here, logic trees, asset related problems. If I have time data or some sort of log, then I wanna use one of these time tools to start and then merge into one of the others. If I don't have good information, then I'm gonna focus more on the FMEAs uh, and uh, fish bones to at least start highlighting where I need to focus. Can this be applied in a fleet industry of highway trucks? Absolutely, it can be, um, especially if they're very, very similar, as, similar assets. So if they're all the same make, model, et cetera, 
huge opportunity here because you can solve it in one and then carry that learning across all of those organization or all those assets and reap the benefits across that fleet. Um, so you can definitely leverage this for sure in a fleet of trucks. Does identified action items give us mitigation, not a solution? Sometimes, Neil, that's the only thing we can do. You know, um, we don't always have the ability to redesign or do certain things. So it gives us a mitigation, which re reduces the severity of it. Um, that's still acceptable as long as it's acceptable to the organization, right? So how far do we want to take it? Um, what's the level of acceptable reduction that we're willing to accept? And if that mic mitigation is acceptable, then that's good enough. Um, lots of organizations will create crash carts, for lack of a better term. Um, what that is, is pre-kitted parts for regular breakdown so they can restore a piece of equipment after it fails quicker. Sometimes that's the best thing we can do. And if that's what we need to do, then it's perfectly acceptable. A few more. Can this be used in... AI or machine learning, how about FMEA? So FMEA is a key part of this to develop our failure codes, part of our uh, RCA tools as well. Can this be used in machine learning? Absolutely. Um, if we're seeing a regular occurrence of these failures based on specific failure modes, we'll be able to trend that over time, predict when it's occurring, that type of thing. So absolutely. A um, lot of AI machine learning models that you see for asset performance management is doing this type of thing in the background focused on um, failure modes. All right, are failure codes developed by reliability vetted by maintenance? Depends on the organization. Sometimes it's maintenance, sometimes it's reliability, sometimes it's a group conversation. Um, it really just depends on making sure that whoever develops it, it's gonna support the other. Um, if reliability develops these massive lists, but they're not grouped in that master library concept I talked about, then maintenance is gonna have a huge problem with trying to pick the right ones, make it easy to enter and capture and that sort of thing. So you gotta make sure, not only do we have good codes, but we kinda match it all up so it's easy to capture and enter as well. Deep breath, I think that was all of them. <laughs> <laughs> We were going rapid fire there for a while. Um, if there's any last minute questions, please feel free to send them through. Otherwise, James, thank you so much for, for a great Q&A on top of a great uh, presentation. We're getting a lot of thanks in the chat. So I think that that was a really well received and, and awesome presentation today. All right. If um, anyone has any questions afterwards that they want to go over, I'm on the maintenance community. You can find me there, ask your questions away, and I'll be more than happy to answer. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I recommend reaching out to James. He's always super, super happy to help and clarify and share any information he has. So um, thank you once again, and, and thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.